house of the Lord this evening, and everyone said amen. Amen. We're having our CDC classes. Our teachers are out there with your young people. The pastor is out of town. He is at general conference this week. Um, we're just going to pray that God keeps them safe as they travel. They're having a wonderful time, but we're just going to have a good time here tonight, and everyone said amen. Amen. Let's lift our hands and let's ask the Lord to touch us tonight and have his way in this service. Lord, we love you and we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for all your many blessings. Lord, we ask that you would touch us this evening. Have your way in this service. Open our hearts and minds to receive from you this evening. And we'll not fail to give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, we'll praise you and we'll thank you. Let's clap our hands unto the Lord and give him praise. Yeah. 
and it's all in him. Hallelujah. He found to be everything you've ever needed. Give him some praise right now in the house. Amen, amen. Clap your hands unto the Lord and give him praise. Amen, amen. Amen. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord this evening. It's good to see all of you here in service with us tonight. Why don't you step out of your seat, shake a couple of hands real quick, tell them how glad you are to see them in the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to be here this evening. Uh, a couple of real quick announcements for us. <clears throat> Our FTC marriage retreat is November the 10th through the 12th. There's a sign-up sheet at our guest services desk. Our bishop will be speaking on for better or worse at the marriage retreat. And uh, you have a non-refundable deposit of $100 is due this coming Sunday. So, again, if you're interested in going, please sign up at the guest services desk, and we greatly appreciate that. And everyone said amen. Amen. We are going to ask our ushers to come at this time as our bishop is going to be coming to receive our tithes and offerings. It's always good 
a pleasure and an honor to give unto the Lord. And everyone said amen. Amen. As our bishop comes, he's going to receive our tithes and offerings. Good to be in the house of the Lord again tonight. Can you say amen? amen? It's always good to give and do the work of the Lord. We appreciate this church and your willingness to give and your consistency in giving. And we always say that because it's the truth. We're going to put our screen on the screen, our theme scripture. And uh, this is the Bible. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Press down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Luke 6, 38, the Bible. And while this is fresh on my mind, two things. When you leave tonight, look at the mobile units out here. Just go out that way, turn and look at them. Uh, brother and Sister Crawford power washed the units today for us, and they did it just because they love the work of the Lord and they love the church. Just give them a hand, and they really, really, really look good, and they look almost like they've been painted, and we appreciate what they do. The second thing is, I want to tell you is that if you've been trying to call me and I haven't been answering, I've got a new telephone, and I don't have all the numbers programmed into it. And uh, I get so many calls that I don't know, and I usually don't answer the call if I don't know it. I wait till they leave me a message, and then I'll call them back. But I'm trying to get the numbers programmed in. So if you call me and uh, I text you and ask you who you are, don't be mad at me. It's because I don't have you programmed in yet, and, uh, and I will do that. It's, a, it's a, actually a disaster to change phones. And I wouldn't have changed if I hadn't dropped mine and broke the crystal on it, or broke the front of it, but uh, I don't like to change, especially something like this. So help me out, be patient with me, and I'll finally get all the numbers again. Thank you for those that, listening to those announcements. We're going to pray. Well, we thank you for the opportunity again to give to the house of God, the work of God, to the cause of God. We pray that you will bless the gift, the giver, and all the people of God in this house tonight. In Jesus' name. And everyone together said amen. God bless you. We want to go to the Lord together in prayer. <clears throat> Excuse me. We want to pray for Paula. This is Sister Kim Eskew's sister. Very sick and in the hospital. Needs healing in her body. Also, we want to pray for Sister Ann Bailey. She had surgery today, so we want to pray that God touches her and ask that the Lord would just let a speedy recovery come. She should be able to come home to, uh, tomorrow, hopefully. And so we're praying that God would touch touch her and then also we have a victory report the last few weeks um, Dolores 
Carruthers, I hope that's correct, was unable to walk and after receiving the Holy Ghost can now walk. And so we would praise the Lord for that. Uh, this is one of the nursing home uh, patients that Brother and Sister Fox go and see every week. And we're thankful for what the Fox, Brother and Sister Fox do. Amen. It, goes, it does not go unnoticed. Amen. We thank you so much for your compassion for that. Also want to pray for Peggy Knight. Uh, needs, has a special need. Um, can't speak after, uh, after having a stroke. So she is a little frustrated and trying to communicate. And so we want to pray that God touches her. Also we want to pray for Brother Bo Chandler. Actually, if you see Brother Bo, you see something a little bit different about him. He, is, he had uh, eye surgery yesterday, and so we're thankful that God kept him on that, but we're just a speedy recovery comes to his eyes, and we're, we're excited for Brother Bo. He, uh, he said he hadn't been able to see for two years, and I'm like, well, Brother Bo, that's not comforting, knowing that you've been driving those two years. And so, <laughs> and so but we're, we're so excited for Brother, Brother Chandler. We, we appreciate Brother Chandler and what he does, and everybody said amen. If you have a special unspoken request, you can signify it by the uplifted hand. God knows what they are. I'm going to ask if you could stand, if you're able, all across the building. <clears throat> if you have a special need and you would like to come down, um, we can have some ministers come and they're going to pray with you, pray the prayer of faith over you. She had surgery today and she's out of surgery and uh, it went well, but she's uh, still in the hospital. And also, um, Brother Joe Fagler's uncle passed away. Let's remember that family. Absolutely want to pray for them, that family to comfort them. And like I said, if you want, if you would also uh, continue to pray for Brother Fowler. I have been down there the past few weeks, and I tell him every week that we pray for him. And so we just want to continue to pray for him that God touches him and that church. And everyone said amen. Amen. Let's just take these needs before the Lord, shall we? Heavenly Father, we love you and we're thankful, God, for this day. We're thankful for all your many blessings. God, we're asking that you would touch tonight. Touch all of the needs, all the unspoken requests. Lord, you know the work that needs to be done. God, we're asking that you would touch those that are sick. Let your healing virtue flow through their bodies. We know it's by your stripes that we are healed. And we claim it in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would move upon them, God. Touch every situation, every circumstance, God. You know the work. God, we ask that you would continue to heal Sister Ann. God, touch Peggy Knight right now. Let your healing virtue flow. Touch Paula right now in the name of Jesus. By your stripes that we are healed and we claim it in the name of Jesus. We're thankful for what you've done for Sister Dolores, God. We're thankful that you've touched her body and continue to do so. Touch Brother Joe's family right now. Comfort them in their time of loss. Touch the Hammond family, Lord, in their time of loss. God, let your peace which passes understanding comfort them in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask that you would continue to move in this service. In Jesus' name, we'll praise you and we'll thank you. Continue to stand and worship as they sing.
worship the Lord with a hand of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Magnify the Lord together with a hand clap. Would you do that? Hallelujah. 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 Jesus' name. Jesus' name. If you have your Bibles tonight, you can turn with us to the book of St. John, chapter 11. If you do not have your Bibles, you can read this on the screen. And we appreciate you being with us in Bible study on Wednesday evening. And uh, it's important. And uh, I talk with a number of pastors who, who really feel like the Wednesday evenings are suffering and uh, because of poor attendance. But we have our classes going on out here. And then we have a good attendance in our auditorium, and we appreciate that. And I know that most of you are working during the day, and you have to come in and change and get ready and come to church. And But we appreciate your dedication to the Lord to do this. And God notices, and he has admonished us to not forsake assembling. And it's important for us to do that. It's enriching for us. From the book of... St. John chapter 11, I'm going to read verses 38 through 45. It's a little longer than what I generally read for a text, but it's a, it's a good little story, and you'll enjoy listening to it again. Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone. We don't know who did it. We don't know the names of the people or how many were involved in it. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clubs, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, them, we don't know who, loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. And everybody said amen. amen. And I want to speak tonight for a few minutes. This will probably just be my introduction, but my subject title is Take ye away the stone. Take ye away the stone. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, tonight we thank you again for this gathering of your people. We pray that you will speak through us to the people of God here tonight and that you will use what we have to say and that you will enrich it and put more in it than we put in it to give them individually what they need beyond what we have prepared to give them because you are great. In Jesus' name, and everyone together said amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I first heard this story in Sunday school uh, a lot of years ago, uh, well over probably 55, close to 60 years ago. And uh, when I heard the story, I recognized it as a great miracle that was intriguing to me. I was impressed by that, but I was also curious about certain parts of the story. 
So I raised my hand in the Sunday school class and asked the teacher why Jesus did not remove the stone. If he could raise Lazarus from the dead, surely in my thinking as a child, he could move the stone. And some of the guys there that were sitting back in the back with me began to laugh about this and laughed at my question and started cutting up with each other. And they made kind of a big deal out of it. And the teacher uh, said that I was creating a disturbance in the classroom. So she sent me upstairs <laughs> to sit with my mother. And uh, that was a dilemma. That was my first encounter with wondering why Jesus didn't move the stone. But many years later, I was in a college classroom and the instructor was teaching on the life of Christ. And I asked the question again. And this time I was told that in the face of such a notable miracle, it was of no consequence as to why Jesus did not move the stone. And there was a chorus of amens from a classroom and shouts and amens and hallelujahs. And so we just moved on. I didn't get sent out. Didn't get sent back to mama, but we just moved on. However, over the years, as I have matured in ministry and grown in, in the Lord, I have referred to the moving of the stone and used it as a way that God had of involving men in the peripheral of his miraculous deeds. But I've never preached or taught specifically about the moving of the stone until tonight. So tonight, I want to teach for a little while, or begin to teach for a little while, on the moving of the stone at Lazarus' tomb. Just a few days back, we had a message in tongues here at the church about God's desire to move in the lives of His people and in the church, and He desired to move in a sovereign way, that He would do great things in our lives and in the church, but He would do it sovereignly. I also explained behind the message and behind the interpretation, I explained that while a sovereign act of God doesn't need the assistance of men, even though it involves men, man is often the reason for the miracle and the benefactor of the miracle, but not the cause of it or the power behind it. God often allows men to set the stage for the miracle, and sometimes men are themselves the stage of the miracle. But God often, even though He moves sovereignly in the actual work of the miraculous, men are often involved in what He does. The woman with the issue, it was amazing, God could have healed her on the spot. Evidently, she had some knowledge, and, and if tradition is correct, maybe she was indeed a, a woman of the night. Maybe the dis disease that she had was brought on by her behavior. Perhaps that could be the case. But in all of it, at least some way, she understood prayer. And in her prayer and her talking, the Bible said that she came to the realization, and she actually said to herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment. I'm going to be made whole. Now, all of us understand that her touching the hem of his garment was not a miraculous thing. Her going to all the difficulty and trouble that she had to go to to find him was not the miraculous thing. God had a miracle for her and he set that in her spirit that he was going to do this for her if she would touch the hem of his garment. So while God did the work sovereignly, none of us would question, none of us believed that there was something about that garment that healed her, something about the touch that healed her. We all understand that the miraculous power that healed her was the power of God. And we also understand that God could have healed her in the prayer meeting where she prayed and first understood that if she would find him and touch the hem, she'd be healed. God could have healed her there without her going anywhere, without her doing anything. 
God could have sovereignly just killed him. We don't know people with oil, but God can heal you without us anointing you with oil. But he told us that you call for the elders and let them anoint you with oil, and they're going to pray, I'm going to heal you. God sovereignly heals, but he also sovereignly has decided to involve us in the process, but not the power. So the lady who had the issue of blood was in charge of the process. The Lord said, yeah, the process is yours. You figure out, and he didn't tell her how to do this as far as we know. He just said, you got to figure out where I'm going to be. You got to figure out how to get to me. And when you get to me, you got to figure out how to get through the crowd. You got to figure out how to get to where I'm standing, and you got to figure out how to touch my garment. And if you do this, I'm going to sovereignly, sovereignly heal you. It's amazing sometimes we stumble over the process, and because of that, we miss the miracle. God has something great for us. God speaks something great into our spirit, tells us he's going to do a sovereign thing for us, and then he lays out the process for us, and we stumble all around on the process, and then we, we never get what God has promised to give us because we never engage in the process. Be not weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall reap if you faint not. I don't know how often she got tired, how many times she got tired, how many times she got to the place where Jesus just left from. And she said, where is it? They said, he's gone. You just barely missed him. Well, he's gone over here. So she went over there, and, and then maybe she missed him again. We don't know how many times she missed him, how many times she came short, or how many times she failed to be able to get through to him. We just know the one time that she was successful. That's the one story that we know about. She found him, and she pressed her way through, and she touched his hem, and she got her miracle. God wants to sovereignly work, and God has, I know, God has, God has spoken to us in this church. He's told us that through tongues. I've spoken to you. I've told you. If there's any church that's a revelation church, this is it. Him that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. We certainly qualify. We need to listen to what God is saying to us. And then let him give us the process, and then we understand that the process is not the miracle. And the process is not a sovereign aspect of the miracle. The process is ours. It's as human as as human can be. But when we do the process, he does the miraculous. He does the miracle. So the woman found her way. That's an amazing story. And y'all pardon me, I don't like to get updates. I'm afraid to touch anything on here because it'll go off on me. You come here and touch this thing, and if it goes up, I'm going to blame you. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Miracle. Miracle. <laughs> that was the process. <laughs> that was the process. God just divided me. Don't let this thing go. My, my grandson updated this thing, and I said, no, don't ever update anything else I got. <laughs> Leave me un un unupdated. I just. <laughs> Blind bar a mess. It's an amazing thing. Here was a blind man, and God had purpose to sovereignly heal him. Evidently, there was some way and somehow that Bartimaeus knew, because we don't get the idea from the story about Bartimaeus that Bartimaeus was shocked that he was healed. We don't get the story that he was shocked that Jesus came by where he was. The idea of the whole story is that Bartimaeus was strategically placed, and he was not surprised when Jesus came by, 
And he wasn't surprised when Jesus called for him because he was persistent in making sure that the Lord knew that he had done the process. Somewhere in it all, we don't know how this happened, and maybe you call what I'm saying speculation, but he was there, so that's not speculation. Somewhere he had it in his head. God gave him the process. Part of man, I'm going to be at such and such a place. If you'll show up there and you'll sit by the wayside and beg until I get there, and when I get there, make sure that I know that you're there. There'll be all kind of people around me, all kind of folks talking to me, and you cry out for me. You, you cry out for me until I hear you, and no matter what anybody tells you to do, if they tell you to hush, don't hush. Because I've got a sovereign miracle for you, but you've got a process to get it. So whoever he had to get to lead him there, whoever he had to help him find the place, he got somebody. We don't know how many folks he went to and said, are you tied up tomorrow? I will meet Jesus. Yeah, I'm tied up. I can't do it. Are you tied up? Oh, yeah, you look busy. Are you tied up over here? Are you tied up? He finally found somebody to help him find his way there. He got there. He found the right place to sit. He had, okay, I can project my voice now. When he comes here, I'm going to call. And he called out to Jesus. Now, it's obvious that the Lord could have healed Bartimaeus before he ever came there. He could have made it simple. He said, I'm going to heal you right where you are. You just show up there and give me thanks. That way you can find your own way. You ain't got to worry about getting somebody to help you find the way. I'm going to heal you right here, right where the process starts. I'm going to heal you. Zap, bam, you heal. Just meet me over there and pray to me so everybody will know that I did that. He didn't do that. There was a process. So whatever Bartimaeus had to do, he, he worked through the process. He made it happen. You know, sometimes we, we get discouraged trying to put together the process to get our miracle. You know, we get offended because other folks aren't as interested in it as we are. But the whole idea is that Bartimaeus had to tell himself, they ain't heard what I heard. They, don't, they aren't interested in helping me get this too early in the morning for them, but they ain't heard what I heard. I'm not going to get mad. I'm just going to keep on fighting until I find somebody that's going to get with me and help me get to where I'm going. I'm not going to let you offend me and keep me from my miracle. Sometimes God... God calls us specifically to do something that he is going to give us a sovereign miracle in it. And because we can't get the right people on board with us, we just simply miss the process. Well, I tried to get it going. I tried to get it started. I tried. God just, God spoke to you. God gave you the process. So whatever old Barmanis had to do, he did it. I admire him. I admire him. And then when he got there, he had gone to all the trouble to get there. He had sat by the highway side begging. He had cried out to the Lord, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Thou son of David. We don't know how long he did this. But he cried out. He couldn't see, so we don't know how far away Jesus was when he started crying out. So he cried out and cried out. And people around him said, Listen, man, listen. You have cried, you get on all our nerves. People moved away from him. He was screaming right in there, Son of David, have mercy on me. So finally, the Lord heard him. And then you would think he's done all this stuff. Why don't the Lord just heal him where he's sitting? But if the journey wasn't over yet. The process wasn't finished yet. He had to go to where the Lord was. He had a little bit further to go. Sometimes just being where he is still is not where you're supposed to be. Being in the general area is not where you're supposed to be. He said, I want you to come closer. Come closer. So he was so sure that what he heard was right, that he threw away his beggar's garment, cast off his garment. I don't know if he had a beggar's cup or not. Gave it away. Said, y'all want this? Y'all have it. <laughs> I'm out of here. I'm taking off my beggar's garment. I'm getting rid of my cup. I'm laying down my walking stick. I'm going to Jesus. I'm going to get a miracle. He is sovereignly going to heal me. It's a sovereign thing, but the sovereign thing doesn't happen without the process. So 
he finally got over to where Jesus was. And Jesus healed him. Now, this is the way apostolic starts. I'll, I just about guarantee you, when the Lord healed him, that crowd went nuts. They fell all over themselves shouting, Oh, God, God's great, God's great, blind man healed, blind man healed you. But nobody got excited until they saw it. Bartimaeus has been excited for days, maybe weeks. I, I can't hardly wait. I can't hardly wait. God's going to heal me down the road. God's going to heal me in a few days, in a few weeks. Well, if God's going to heal, why don't he just heal you now? He didn't get discouraged. Years ago, a lady attended a church, and she was a very heavy lady. And she began to testify about God has healed her from being obese. And she was still, I mean, she could barely get between the pews. And she was testifying, God has healed me. God's healed me. And people just kind of dropped their head and, you know, took the fingernails. And they were embarrassed that she was declaring she was healed. She, healed she was, she was still, you know, technically she was still two tons of fun. There she was. <laughs> and they were saying, <laughs> God healed me. But in the process, she just kept saying, God's healed me, God's healed me, God's right. healed me. And then she was gone away for a little while, but not long. Not long enough for her to have gone on a program to lose all that weight. She came back. And she said, I just wanted to be sure to testify today. Some of y'all have not recognized me yet. But she said, I'm the lady that told y'all God healed me. And he told me way back then, you're healed. And they looked around, and when they finally realized where she was, they were ready to tear the church apart. They are shouting and carrying on and having a good time because now they could see what God had already told that lady he was going to do. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to give it to you. But this is the process. This is the process. We don't need to get stumped in the process. God's going to give us it. We keep trying to figure out ways to short circuit the process. So many times when we feel like God's got a great thing for us, we keep asking ourselves, well, why hasn't it happened yet? Because it isn't time yet. Amen. Now, y'all think I forgot about Lazarus. I'm going to come back to the grave. The blind man who the Lord put a poultice in his eyes, and, and, you know, I know that this is not a very pleasant thing, and I, I'm not out to offend anybody, but um, the streets of, of the city were not paved. Jerusalem, all of them, they were not paved. And animals would use those streets for thoroughfares, oxen and sheep, beasts of burden, and horses and mules and donkeys. And, and you know that they are, they're not generally potty trained. So the streets were filled with dust and dung. And here is this Lord who bent over. Spit would have been bad enough. If it would have just been spit for some of us, we just, we just said, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. But he took the dust and the dung and the spit and made a poultice. Wow. You, you don't have to use much imagination to, I mean, I got some imagination I could share with you, but I'm, I'm going, but they just, he just stirred it together. He just stirred it together. And <laughs> you know, my mind still, I got that kid's mind, it just goes everywhere, you know. I have to pull it back. <laughs> but he made a poultice. This poor guy was blind. He didn't see this stuff going on. <laughs> If he had been blind, he might have been gone. <laughs> but, but this is the process. This is the process. Never had done it before. 
It would have been better if somebody could have said, oh, yeah, I saw him do that the other week over at that Bethesda. Yeah, I saw him do that. I saw him do that down in Canaan. It's really neat. But they never, anybody ever seen him do this, and they all were thinking, what is he doing? He's making a, some stuff. And then he puts it on this guy's face. And the people are going, eh, eh, eh. And they see this stuff, you know, the spittle and the dust and the other stuff. And they put it in there. And they said, it's a good thing that guy is blind. It's a blessing from God. He can't see. The Lord put that over there. Then he... Then when he did that, you know, that would have been that would have been something if the Lord had stepped back and said, Be thou made whole. Open up your eyes and see. They sent this poor guy with that stuff running down his face. I'm not going to tell you what color it was, but I think I know. Running down his face. And they said, Now you go to the pool and wash. He didn't, he didn't tell him how to get there. He didn't designate two people to take him. He didn't say, you and you take this guy to the pool. And he can't see already. And he's got his, got his eyes full of dust and dung and spit. Y'all take him down there. But he said, you go wash. You get there the best way that you can. Sometimes I think we're just too plain sissy to get the miracle God's got for us. We're just too easily offended to say, you put all this junk on my face and I can't see it, but I get a whiff of it. Didn't say he couldn't smell. <laughs> so now you got to find your way with all this stuff on your face. You got to find your way to the poo. Sometimes we just, we are just so super sensitive that God's got this terrific miracle we just haven't got the wherewithal to follow the process to get it. And we all know God can do it without the process. But he involves us in the process. Amen. So he went... And probably some of the people who were there probably followed him just out of curiosity. They didn't know anything was going to happen. They just wanted to see what this guy was going to do when he washed all this junk out of his eyes. So they probably people followed him out there. And I, if they did follow him, I can just about tell you, when he washed his face and got all the gunk and the doing the gunk off his face and he could see, he turned around and said, I can see. They probably tore up the side of the pool, praising God. Yay! Woo! Yay, yay, yay! <laughs> Look what the Lord hath done. Yeah. Unbelieving bozo, you know. That's why sometimes we are, we are sitting on a miracle. Instead of Instead of getting the process, we're trying to hatch it, I think. We're just sitting on it. 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 And God said, you got to get involved in the process. I believe that there are people in the church here locally that, and I'm not mad at you. I don't think God's mad at you. God's got something for you. God has designated that you are are going to have this certain thing, but there's a process you need to get into. And the, because the process may weary you, you may want just a shortcut, or you may want to short-circuit the process to get what you know God has already promised you. Sometimes we feel like because we've got the promise, we have the present entitlement, and we are exempt from the process. But what we don't understand is that our miracle is somewhere in the process. And until we engage ourselves in the process, we aren't going to get 
what God has for us that's miraculous. The Lord arrived at Lazarus' tomb. He'd been dead, been dead four days. And the Lord was, was not accidentally four days late. You know, if we, if we tried to put God on our clock, if we'd have been waiting on a, a doctor to get there, then he would have been too late. We'd have been waiting on the best heart surgeon or the heart doctor or cardiac specialist um, to get there, it had been too late. He'd been dead four days. Four days. The best doctor couldn't help him. The team, the surgeon from Emory, the specialist from our greatest hospitals in Boston couldn't help the guy. They were absolutely too late to help him. But the Lord doesn't operate on the same time frame. And sometimes, even though we know that, we lose hope when what we want God to do isn't done before it's the absolute worst it can be. And him being dead four days was pretty bad. Pretty bad. Four days dead in the humid, hot climate. Four days dead. They didn't embalm. So you can imagine the shape that the body was in, and the Lord knew that. That was a part of the process. That's why he took so long to get there. When he got there, they thought, wow, he's here. He can, at least he can comfort us. This guy's dead. He's buried. So it's good God came. It's good the Lord came. It's good Jesus came here, but... It'll be good for us to cry on his shoulder. But when he got there, he told them, he said, he was groaning. He was hurt. They said, he's hurt. He's sad. He was groaning. Then he told them, he said, move ye or take ye away the stone. Take ye away the stone. Now here is the idea. We, we don't know who took the stone away. But can you imagine, just for a minute here, let me, let me deviate for a minute. Can you imagine the guys who took the stone away after the Lord raised him from the dead? Can you imagine the story they had to tell? They say, hey, y'all ain't going to believe this. Y'all ain't going to believe I just followed the crowd the other day, and when I got there, some, this Jesus came up, and he said, move the stone, and nobody would move it. So I thought, hey, man, I'm, I'll help move it. I want to see what's going to go on here. And I moved the stone. And you ain't going to believe, oh, boy, when we moved that stone. Woo, hoo, hoo. Man, yeah, I can bag it. It was terrible. Ooh, the odor just came rolling out of that. <sighs> we moved the stone. But they had a story to tell. Now they were glad to be one of the ones that moved the stone. And if it would have been like it was today, they'd have been special speakers. Hey, we're having a guy speak for us next week that was there, and he moved the stone. <laughs> Y'all can schedule him later, but he was there. There was four of those guys. We've heard three of them speak already. This is the fourth guy. He has a fantastic story to tell. I'm telling you, God involves more people in your miracle than you. While God may sovereignly give you the miracle, he will sovereignly touch the hearts of others. Many believed on him. Take the stone. Take you away the stone. And so they took the stone away. Now, my understanding is that the Lord intentionally wanted to involve others in what was going to happen here. So however many it took to move the stone, however much discussion occurred before the stone was moved, in every one of those situations, God was setting the stage for them to be a part of the process of a miracle like they'd never seen in their life. They came there at random. Nobody planned to be there. The crowd was not invited. They were not chosen. They were not handpicked. Nobody knew who they would be but the Lord. I'm telling you, God's got folks that are going to come and be on the peripheral of what God's going to do for us. And they're going to be the people who take it with us. They're going to be moved by what they see that happens here. 
But there won't be unless we honor the process. So the Lord had to move the stone. And however many it was, they had a story to tell. And I, I, wish, that, I wish that we could interview those people, but we can't. Then he, after that, he called Lazarus. You know, he was going to sovereignly, the only miracle that happened at the tomb, the only miracle was the resurrection of Lazarus. All the other things that happened that were significant, but they were not miraculous. Taking the stone away was significant, but it was not miraculous. Unwrapping the man, taking the grave clothes off the man was significant, <coughs> but it was not miraculous. The only thing miraculous was a sovereign act of resurrection. But God involved other people in it. So he called Lazarus forth from the grave. And he came out. I don't know if he hopped out or how he got out. Maybe he took little baby steps, but he got out. When he got out there, the Lord said, unwrap him and let him go. Now, can you imagine what it would be like to be raised from the dead and wrapped up tight? I mean, I'm, I'm alive. <laughs> I'm alive. <laughs> I've been dead. I'm alive, but I can't shout. I can't holler. I can't jump. It must have been a horrible few seconds before they unwrapped him. Lord said, unwrap him. We don't know who unwrapped him. We don't know who, but can you imagine the story they had to tell? Right behind the guys that spoke who moved the stone, they scheduled the people who unwrapped him to come and speak. They said, you, you think those guys with the stone got a story? Hey, you wait till you, you, wait till you hear this guy that unwrapped him. I'm telling you, that's really not. They took it, peeled it off layer by layer. That's amazing what they did. They unwrapped him to let him go. And they unwrapped him. They, they Suddenly they began to see they unwrapped the head and I. They said, oh my God. Oh my God, look at you. Look at you. So I know what I'm wrapping up. Shut up, I'm wrapping up. I'm unwrap they unwrapped the guy. The stone moving and the unwrapping were not miraculous, but they were also such an impacting part of the story. They were a necessary, essential part of the story, but not miraculous. So the point I want to make with this, one of the points, is that God wants to do a miraculous thing in this church and in your life. But God has a process in your life that many people will be touched by the process because they're involved in the process and they will be impacted by the miracle, although what they're doing is not miraculous. It's just stuff they do that has to be done. But because of that, many, many believed on Jesus. Many. Not just Mary and Martha and the family, not just Lazarus, but many others who some of them were engaged with moving the stone. Some were engaged with unwrapping him. Some were engaged with moving the wrappings to let him go. Only God was involved in the sovereign act of the miraculous. I wonder how long we've harbored the miraculous in us. God has given us the promise of a miracle. But the process is laborious. The process is long, is extended, and we aren't sure about the process. And, and we, we, as we move through the process, it doesn't flow well. It's not smooth. It's not easy to do, but yet we know we've got this over here. I'm telling you that every step of the process, God will touch somebody in each one of those steps of the process, and then he will validate their faith when he gives you the miraculous. I don't think we've ever lived in a world where the level of faith for the 
for the world, for the sinner, has been as low as it is today. The world has been inundated by false Christianity, by people who have been unfaithful and disloyal, by people who have, who have preached morality and lived in immorality, practiced immorality. The world has been hit hard by pseudo-Christianity and all, all kinds of things. Probably never been a time when the level of faith was lower in the world than it is now, today. And God is going to use His church to raise the level of faith in the world. There has to be an inundation of new faith in the world. There shall be light in the evening time. People who cannot believe that God is anything more than a myth. The Bible is nothing but another storybook. Christianity is no different than any other religion in the world. It's just another way of thinking about what we call God. So the level of faith is there. God's going to birth the miraculous in the church. And in doing so, he's going to pull in to the parameters of the miraculous the people that know nothing about God and have no faith in God. But because they have been touched by the process, touched by the process. It's amazing. How people, a man called me in Athens once and he said, I heard, I heard that so-and-so got the Holy Ghost at your church last night. I said, yeah, they did. They said, let me ask you, make sure that we're talking about the same person. Actually, it was Billy Fowler, it was Brother Fowler. Got the Holy Ghost in our church. They said, let me make sure that I got the right Billy Fowler. Is this the guy that plays the guitar? Yeah, that's the guy that plays the guitar. Short guy? Yeah, he's a short guy. He played two weeks ago at the J&J &J Center. I don't know. They told me he did. I don't know much about the, the back part of it. Yeah, yeah, he played over there when, when Willie was there. Willie, Brother Willie. <laughs> Willie's still living, folks. Still, he must be 130, but he, <laughs> Willie's still living. Almost. He's alive. <laughs> He's the one who did this. He's the one. Well, you know, I, somebody told me they said he'd never go to church. He's got folks in his church, in his family, that are apostolic, that are Pentecostal, and he sees the hypocrisy. He's no, I can't, I can't believe, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. I, I just can't believe. I said, well, I tell you what you do. You come down here next Sunday, and we're going to let him sing. I just made up my mind right there. We're going to let him sing. I said, we're going to let him sing. I didn't know what he would sing. I was going to tell him what to sing. We're going to let him sing. That guy came. He said, I'm coming. I'm coming. And I'm bringing my wife and my young ones. And he came and he brought his wife and his young ones. And when, when Brother Fowler, before Brother Fowler started singing, he started crying. The little guy started crying. He go back. He sat back. <laughs> he just cried. I said, oh, get him, God. Get him, God. Brother Fowler sang. I think he... I think he might have sang Unclouded Day. You know, that's kind of, oh, they tell me. Oh, Willie sings that, too. <laughs> he sang. This old guy cried, got the Holy Ghost. His wife got the Holy Ghost. Had a great move of God. I'm telling you, God just does things. He just does things. And Brother Fowler told me when I greeted him at the church, I said, we're so glad to have you. He said, I only came because I promised him I'd come, and he won't shut up. He won't leave me alone. So I'm coming just so he will leave me alone. He kind of let me know that he wouldn't be back. This was the first and the last. The Alpha and the Omega, I ain't been back. God's got those kind of miracles for us. He's got those kind of miracles for us. He's got people right here sitting on miracles that God's going to give you, a sovereign, sovereign miracle. But the process may be, may be, a little length in. The process is going to touch other people. Let God work. Do not lose hope. Mary and her family had it had been four days. They just kind of lost hope. Four days dead. You don't do much with them. You know, I mean, I'm apostolic. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. But if I was going to raise somebody from the dead, I'd want a fresh dead person myself. <laughs> I want somebody that just died. 
I wouldn't want to go to the funeral home, but I said, let me find somebody at the hospital. <laughs> they still got their blood. They still, they still warm to the touch. If I'm going to do that, I want somebody close. Four days dead. Four days. Man, you've got no hope at all. He's going to still be alive. So they kind of lost hope. I'm telling you, what you're looking at, you may think this thing is just never, it's just never going to come. It's just too dead. But I'm telling you, if you will just believe God and set yourself to the process and let God do what he does best, that is the miraculous. You do what you do best. You do the process. I'm closing with this. The man who, who wrote um, the Bible study, Search for Truth, Ronnie Wilhoyt, I remember hearing him testify at a church in Texas. And he said, the Lord gave me this idea about a Bible study. And he said, I put this thing together. And he said, I, I think I've done pretty good. I wrote tracks. Ronnie wrote tracks. Sent them out good tracks. First real color tracks. We had powerful tracks. And he said, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. And he was testifying to the church and said, but I, I, I see in my heart this is going to be a miraculous, miraculous thing. And Brother Kilgore came up behind his testimony. He said, the best thing I can tell you is just you understand that what God is giving you is a miracle. And if you will wait to the right time without being impatient, without giving up, it will happen. And it happened. For a while, Search for Truth was the Bible study in the United Pentecostal Church. I still have one powerful powerful Bible study, still used. Matter of fact, uh, Brother Will Hort, I believe he's gone on to meet the Lord, but the, the Bible study stands on. The organization still has it. It's a great, great tool. And many, many people, many people were caught up in the process. Because he said, God gave it to me. He gave me this thing. And, and old Brother Kilgore said, just, said, just hold it. If God gave it to you, you got it. It's miraculous. God's going to give you the miracle. And I think the Church for Truth went from, it went around the world. Around the world. Around the world. And it's still going around the world. Isn't that something? Take ye away the stone. Next week I want to talk about the stones that we need to move. For God to do a miracle in our life. All right, I'm going to let Brother Michael know that I didn't fudge because he wasn't here. I'm quitting on time. <laughs> I love y'all. God bless you. Shall we stand together? Give the Lord a hand clap of praise and magnify the Lord. <laughs> hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Well, the Lord is good, amen? Amen. I appreciate what our bishop has talked to us and spoke to us tonight. We're so thankful. Uh, let's just lift our hands and let's ask the Lord to touch us tonight and keep us safe as we travel and let us take this, what we've heard tonight. Lord, we love you and we're thankful for this evening. Lord, we're thankful for all your many blessings. We're thankful for what our bishop spoke to us this evening. Lord, we ask that you would help us, God. Help us go with us, keep us safe, help us take this, put, keep it in our hearts. Lord, we're anticipating, God, great things from what we've heard this evening. Lord, we ask that you would go with us, keep us safe, and bring us back at the appointed time. In Jesus' name, we'll praise you and we'll thank you for it. Amen and amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. In Jesus' name, shake hands and be friendly.